How you can make the word of God flesh to you. So I want to talk to you about the connection between faith and grace. Now, to understand why God, the Holy Spirit, put the two together, let me explain something to you to help you to understand why this was presented this way. We know grace is what God does as a gift that he gives to man without man having to do anything to get it. If you have to do something for grace, it's no more grace. If grace is a gift, that means you can't work for it. You can't work for a gift. If you work for something, it will not be a gift. It will be an income or salary, a recompense, a payment for work done. But if it's a gift, it means that you didn't have to do anything at all. Somebody just loved you favored you to give it to you without even having to work for it. You understand that? It's a thing about grace as a gift. Now, the Bible says it is of faith that it might be by grace, which says that for grace to happen to you, for you to get that gift, it is faith that triggers it. Grace is available to all. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, let's look at it very quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Who have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It is God's desire for all men to be saved. And so Jesus died for all men. But you and I know that not all men are being saved. Would you agree? Yes. Not men, men are dying and going to hell. Yes. But on the other hand, every day, yeah. But on the other hand, it is God's will. Who will? It's his will for all men to be saved. And so, and so the Bible tells us that salvation is a gift. Look at Romans chapter 6. Verse 23, quickly, Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, you see that, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so Jesus is a gift from God to us. Salvation is a gift of God for us. It's for everybody, every human being on the face of this earth. But what triggers it? For you to receive this gift is by faith. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at, let's start from verse 1. It says, And you who, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, verse 2, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the chain of disobedience, Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy, say that with me, but God who is rich in mercy, say that again, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ. And it says, by grace, you are what? Saved. Verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Verse 8. For by grace, uh, you know that with me, 
For by grace, read it again, for by grace are you saved through what? And that are not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. And so there is a connection between uh, uh, grace and what? Faith. And it's my task this morning to show you that connection so you can begin to enjoy grace on your life which is the mercy of God on your life, the favor of God on your life, the gift of God on your life. Praise the Lord. So that you don't have to struggle in this life and trust God's grace to work on your behalf and bring to you sweatlessly his promises to come to pass in your life. All right. Now I got your attention. Now, so what we're going to do then is this. Let's look at faith, what faith is. And we know that in this church but I'm going to take a different direction uh, in this teaching so you can get a sense of what I want to do this, this morning. I want you to think about faith as simply believing. It is more than that, but I want for right now to think about faith as believing. If you think about faith as believing, then you will see that that it is of believing that it might be by what? Grace. That means that you cannot have grace on your life if you don't believe it. And that's why it is so important that we have to, that we develop the capacity, the ability, the understanding on how to believe God. Because if you don't believe, grace will not work for you. Knowledge. You cannot believe any further than your knowledge. If I'm going to believe something, I have to at least gain knowledge of that thing before I can believe it. I can't believe to be saved if I don't know that there's anything there called, be, called salvation. I can't believe to be healed if I don't know that God heals. I can't believe to have peace if I don't believe that God grants us peace. But the moment I gain knowledge of something, then it is my responsibility to believe what I've gained knowledge of. So knowledge is important. It is where you get information. Information, and that, that information has to bring understanding. That's what we have on here. With all you're getting, get understanding. That understanding is revelation. And so you gain knowledge, which is gain information, and that information is translated into a revelation. And so information without revelation will not help you. A lot of people go to church, get knowledge of something, but without the revelation of the information that they got, it doesn't bless them. And so as you gain knowledge, let me put to you, come with me to Matthew. You have to get understanding. Come with me to the book of Matthew and, and pick up this matter of understanding and the importance of it. Go to Matthew chapter 13. Verse 19. When you hear God's word, you got to gain knowledge or understand, uh, gain understanding or revelation from that word. When you gain God, when you receive God's word, you have to gain with that word, you have to gain revelation or understanding of it. That's why, hold on to this. Go to Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. We'll come back to this in a minute. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. And I'll give you what? Pastors. Read that with me. And I'll give you pastors according to mine heart who shall feed you with knowledge. Read it again. And I'll give you pastors according to mine heart who shall feed you with knowledge and understand. Read it again. And I'll give you pastors according to mine heart who shall feed you with knowledge. And so what God's heart is is to give you a pastor who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So it's not enough to go to church without gaining knowledge and understanding when you get the message preached to you. And my job this morning, if truly God has called me, is to give you knowledge and understanding of the connection between faith and grace. That is the reason why you go to church, so you gain a knowledge and understanding. The knowledge is information that will be derived from the Bible that you, then you have to have understanding. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 13. 
verse 19, says, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, when you hear, knowledge is transmitted. When you hear the word of the kingdom and understand it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received by, seed by the wayside. Isn't that something? The Bible says that when you come to church and you hear the word of the kingdom, you know what the word of the kingdom? The word of the kingdom is what you listen to now, right now. When you hear the word of the kingdom and you don't understand it. So I must make sure as I stand here representing the Holy Ghost, I must make sure that you gain understanding today before you go home. Because if you don't get understanding before you go home, Satan, the wicked one, will come and catch away from you what has been sown into you. Are you listening to me here? It's not enough to gain knowledge. You have to also get what? Understanding. For with all you're getting, get what? Understanding. Praise the Lord. Understanding is a revelation of the knowledge of that word that you receive. I listen to me here. So now we have this statement that if you're going to have grace on your life, you must also have with it faith or believing of that which you have been promised by God's word. So let's look at this here. What is believing? Why is it so important? Because grace, your grace depends upon what? Your believing. Your ability to live a life with grace on it. When we say grace is on your life, we say the favor of God is on your life. When we say grace is on your life, the power of God is on your life. We say grace is on your life, the ability to get results is on your life. Oh, when we say grace is on your life, we say a sweatless victory is on your life. And when there's grace on your life, it is perceptible, it is visible, because people can tell that something is working in your life. Even if they don't know what is making it work, they can tell something is working in your life because you seem to sweatlessly get what others struggle so hard to get. But there's a way to get it God's way. There's a way to receive it from God's way. And my task is to make you to see this. Why believing is important? Because believing is a cup that you take to the fountain of grace to get your water of promises poured into that cup. Without the cup, you'll be like the foolish virgins that went out with that oil in their lamps. They went to meet the bridegroom, but they didn't have enough oil in their lamp. That won't be anyone here today, in Jesus' name. So, in believing, let's talk about it. The Bible tells us Go with me to John chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, 24. This is what God, Jesus is saying here. Get this. So, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and you're hearing the word now, this is Jesus' word, and believes, and believes on him that sent me, have is past tense, old English word, it's past tense. It means you've had everlasting. So believing allows you to have. Amen. Believing enables you to possess. Yes. Believing grants you the ability to receive. Because Jesus said, when you believe, you have. And so what do you want? Grace. If I want grace, I must believe. Because when I believe, if I can determine that I have believed, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, but if I can determine that I have believed something, as far as God is concerned, you have that thing. Amen. If you can believe it, and so the difficulty in life sometimes is the ability to believe because there are times doubt sets in. Doubt is a momentary time where one contradicts God's word in your mind. 
in a moment in time, a moment in a time where someone in their mindset, in their thinking, just contradict what God has said. God says that you have, you say you don't. I listen to me here. The moment you do that, you have doubted God. But you can't believe and doubt. Because believing says you have. Believing says you have. Are you getting me here? If you can underline the word believe and underline the word have, the two go together. Are you getting me here? And so if you can determine that you have acted on the kind of, of, of a premise that says that you have believed God, then of course, by you believing God, you will have what it is that you believe God for. Let me give you another scripture to support this. Come with me. I said, Matthew, let's go to John chapter 5. We just read verse 24. Let's go to John chapter 3, verse 36. John 3, 36. And let's look at another example here. So he that believeth on the Son hath. When you believe, you have. On the Son is whom? Jesus. Who is Jesus? The Word. Right? So you, you believe on the Word, you have. All you have to do is to make sure that you believe. Because if you believe, you have. That, that, what, you know, in fact, the Bible says that there are two classes in the world. Two classes of people. Believers and unbelievers, not white and black, not rich and poor, not male or female, it is believers and unbelievers. If you say you believe, God says you're saying that you believe him and demonstrating by your deed, by your actions that you believe God, you already have what he's promised you. And there are those who don't believe. And because they don't believe, they don't have what God has promised. It's a sad thing for your daddy to collect all the goodies and say that what is mine is yours, and you never come home to get it. Because you don't believe it. Imagine if I were to tell you, those of you who come back to church next Sunday, I will give each of you a million dollars. Yeah. Appreciate it. Right. She says she appreciates it. All right. Now imagine that. <laughs> One of the first things you want to do is a parcel, where do you bank? <laughs> we want to make sure that your bankers can tell us you have that much money in your account. And then I can believe you to show up. Are you going to be here? But it, the, my point is, is that the, the, the person who promises has to have credibility. That's what God said in his word. That Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 1, verse 20. That a person who promises must have a credibility and integrity, the, the ability to perform what he had promised. For all the promises of God, in him, in Jesus, who is the word, in the word, are yes. And in him, amen, which means so be it. Unto the glory of God by us. And so whenever God promises, as far as he's concerned, it is done with. And then all it takes is for you to be able to receive it. And the way you receive something in the spirit is by believing it. And so believing grants you an opportunity to undertake a spiritual transaction where in the spirit supernaturally you receive something that your eyes cannot see, but sooner or later it will manifest where people can see what you have believed. Oh, praise the Lord. And so the thing that comes with grace is that you want to believe in order for you to have what grace has promised. Come to, with me to Acts chapter 24. When you believe, you also gain hope. In Acts 24, verse 14, 
He says, but this I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I God of my fathers. Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, verse 15, and have. Paul said, believing I have. Have hope toward God. And so when you believe, again, that is a spiritual equivalent of receiving something in the physical material realm. He said, when I believe those things that were written in the, in the holy uh, scriptures, the holy prophets, uh, I, I came to have hope toward God. So you lack in hope, check your believing. You lack expectation, check your believing. Because you believe, you should have hope toward God. If you say you believe. Because it is he who has promised you in his word. And when you say you believe him, what you have done is, is that you have now said to him, because I trust you, because I come, I've come to understand that you have the ability, the capacity to produce what you have promised me, I receive what you said that you've given me. Even though I haven't seen it yet. Believing, believing is a transaction that takes place in lieu of what it is that you possess physically. Instead of possessing something physically, naturally, materially, believing is a transaction that takes place in lieu of it, instead of it. And so when you believe in God for something, you're saying that even though you haven't actually physically received what God says is yours, the believing is a transaction that takes place in lieu of it, instead of it. It enables you to say that you got it even though you haven't seen it yet. I said, so believe it is a wonderful, wonderful way that you demonstrate your trust towards God. If you say you trust God, then believing gives you the chance to do so. So God, even though I haven't seen the million dollars, because I have to believe that. You know, we believe in to have the money to build the church, the new church building, debt free, right? We are believing it, right? And because we are believing it, it is an act that enables us to conduct a transaction without actually seeing physically the transaction that we are conducting. But it is no less unreal. It is as real, in fact, it is more real than that. Because when you believe, you take root. When you believe, you take root. And that's important. I'll get to that in a minute to show you the scripture for that. But let's move on. When you believe also, you should have rest. A person who is at rest or is resting knows everything is all right. When you are anxious, it's a sign that you're not at rest. Anxiety is an, is an indication something is missing. That's what the Bible says, be not anxious. Go with me to, uh, uh, to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians, Philippians 4, 6, it says, be, not, be careful for nothing, another translation, be not anxious for anything, but everything by prayer and supplication will thanks even let your requests be known unto God. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which passes all natural understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what is the point here? The point is that I got to make sure, I got to make sure that I am at rest, I am resting. If, if truly I have believed, in fact, one indicator that you are truly in possession spiritually of what God has promised you, one indication is the peace of God over your life. If there is no peace there, it means that you haven't got him yet. Go back to, to the drawing board and figure out what is going on. Why don't I have this peace? Because the peace isn't there suggests that you're not in all the way. Because when you are at peace, you are at rest, and it says believing will produce that rest. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. So for we which have believed do enter into rest. Do you know how many people die before their time because they can't find rest? They can't find peace? For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he has said, as I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Hold on to that a second. God says that whatever you want, it was finished even before the world was put together. Thank you for joining us for the Word of Life broadcast. I'm Clarissa Arthur, Pastor Arthur's wife, and it is always a privilege, an honor, and a joy to bring the Word of God to you and to your home. We trust that it's been a blessing to you. You know, there was a little boy once in our church who said, when we called our church Word of Life Fellowship Church, he didn't really know what fellowship meant, but he knew what ship meant. And he said, Word of Life, that's the ship that God lives on. And so, I hope that's been a blessing to you. We trust that the Word of God is the ship that God lives on in delivering the Word of God to you and to yours. It's always a joy and a privilege to bring the Word to you. And we know that Pastor Arthur gets it fresh from the throne of grace. And he lives it as well as he teaches it every day. I know because I happen to live with him. Anyway, thank you for the joy and honor. And if you've decided to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, or if you need special prayer, please contact us. We will be delighted and honored to be a part of solving the problems in your life. God bless you. Be